talking about like the LSD scene, like almost talking about from your personal perspective, like when you even first became aware of LSD and then, you know, as it moved on and it became illegal, you know, and like what that meant, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and how effective, like, you know, all the people in the scene or, or whatever. So I first became aware of LSD, uh, just like I first became aware of marijuana uh, through the dead. Um, Kreutzmann was our senior year uh, when that band was just getting started. He was hanging out with these guys in West Menlo Park with Jerry, and there was a scene going down there. And it was poets, it was Kesey, it was writers, it was musicians. Um, and they were getting high and they were playing music and kind of exploring. And LSD started to be an influence probably in 65, more so in 66. Now the way, there was something called the human being, which was in Golden Gate Park, and it was the first major quote unquote event of hippies um, coming together in one place and listening to music and getting high. That was in 66, and Tim Leary was there, Allen Ginsberg was there, The Dead, Big Brother, Quicksilver Messenger Service, um, some other bands. And we drove up from Santa Cruz, my friends and I were down in Santa Cruz now, staying at David Guy's house for the weekend. And we were gonna go, and then we weren't gonna go, and then we decided we would go. Now, driving up there, we talked about something that Kreutzmann had told us about, which was LSD. We didn't, because it used to be served in Kool-Aid, that's where electric Kool-Aid, Tom Wolf's book, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And everybody would enter, paying a dollar to get in, and then there's some Kool-Aid that you could drink, and people in the know would realize that the Kool-Aid had LSD in it, but some people who walked in off the street who paid a dollar didn't really understand what it was that they were doing. So, I mean, you don't need much LSD. When you pour it in Kool-Aid, um, you need to pour a pretty good amount in there. So the first conversations that we had about it was um, about drinking Kool-Aid, because Kreutzmann had told us about it, that they were experimenting with this stuff that was stronger than pot. So we went up that day, and um, that's when Timothy Leary famously said, and he was gone on LSD that day, so was Ginsburg and probably most of the dead, and everybody else. We weren't, we were college kids. We were just kind of experimenting, as it were. Um, and that day, Leary famously said for the first time, Turn on. Tune in and drop out. You drop out of high school, drop out of college, drop out of graduate school, drop out of uh, junior executive, drop out of senior executive, turn on, tune in, drop out. tune in, turn on, or turn on, tune in, drop out. I'll never forget it. Sitting there in the lotus position in pajamas, yakking away and talking about why we needed to don't do anything our parents said and drop out of college. Uh, Timothy Lear was all about dropping out and, and dropping in to a new, another lifestyle. And I listened to what he said, and, and we all did. And, he was making LSD out to be something that would forever um, change us for the better, that we would become in touch with ourselves. He was quite a guy, you know, he was a professor, he and, and Richard Alpert, who went on to become Ram Dass, of course, they had been experimenting with LSD back in New York, and they brought it out to California, and the scene was ideal for 
leery. It's as though the San Francisco uh, revolution, as it were, uh, came right on time for him and for LSD. So he was the, really the number one proponent. And soon, so after that day, LSD was part of the vernacular for me, and it slowly but surely made its way into um, the general population. Now, there weren't pills at that point, and there was no Osley at that point. There was, basically LSD was dosed through liquid. We didn't know how much, and the first time I ever did it was Kool-Aid. Um, it was a heavy dose, though. And, and I was fine, but it, that's what LSD was. I knew, I had great respect for it after that, and, the, and its potential not destructive, but it's potential to leave a mark, I guess you might say. Because nobody was measuring how much was going into this, these Kool-Aid doses. Um, but it never left. And so probably within two years, um, Osley was, now I knew of Osley because of the debt. And when the debt left and moved to LA, uh, in 66, Osley financed everything. Now, Osley had family money. His father was the ex-governor of Kansas, the Stanley family. Um, they were two or three generation successful, politically connected folks. Um, Osley moved out here to go to Berkeley. Uh, brilliant guy, he was a chemist and came out to get an education and fell in with the Grateful Dead very early on. Um, he picked up on the LSD deal from, from Leary and set about making LSD. Um, it was soon available and of course it had names like Orange Sunshine and Blue Cheer, uh, the two most famous ones. And nobody else was making it, so if you have blue tabs, with Osley's cross on it, you knew you had the real deal. And he was a good chemist. So you could do a half, you could do a quarter, um, and, it, and you could trust it. The same thing with Orange Sunshine, the barrels, the original barrels. You could trust that it was, and it was correctly dosed. So um, it became, if you sold marijuana locally, you probably sold some LSD too. At least I did. I didn't see anything wrong with LSD um, from the standpoint that it wasn't an addictive drug, it was a, a psychedelic. Um, it had the potential to put you in a place where you would never go back to who you were before you did LSD. Um, I always was a big proponent of doing it in nature, um, having a guide as opposed to everybody just dropping and going to the city. I never did that. I didn't trust myself. Uh, I didn't trust that I wouldn't have a bad experience, as it were. Suppose man can use more of his brain. What's he going to do, make more money or build faster cars? Um, LSD research, far from settling or answering anything, just raises new paradoxes about where man is going as a species. Um, and. It was everywhere. Now, there was bad acid. There were other people making it at a certain point. But we only ever got Osley, and I knew where it came from. I got it from one of Osley's friends in Palo Alto. Um, and I rented his apartment, his loft, after he moved out. And that's where I found stashes of Osley acid for the whole time I lived there. I found them hidden here, hidden there. Um, I got to know Osley later, but as far as the LSD scene, LSD uh, in, in uh, conjunction with marijuana, they kind of went hand in hand. I never gave LSD to anybody that didn't want it. Uh, if they wanted it, I explained to them what they could expect and recommended low dosages to start. I felt a responsibility to do that. Um, marijuana, not so much. 
but I didn't want anybody having a bad experience on LSD and telling whoever that they got it from me. Um, it was legal for a couple of years, but once it got into society in general um, and there was bad reports and bad trips, like everything else, um, the law came down. Let me put it this way to you. Do you think this country, at this time, needs something that it hasn't got? Yes. What does it need? Love. The whole people have to know each other, you know? <laughs> what about people older than, say, 30? Older people, do you think they can indulge in this too? Yes, they should. Do they? I don't know if they do, but they should. I didn't quit selling it because I was just selling it locally. And I wasn't selling it to... I wasn't giving it to teenagers and that sort of thing. Um, I wasn't selling large volumes of it. Uh, I lived in Hawaii for a while, and I uh, met a guy over there who was on, sailing on Peter Fonda's boat, and he showed up with a couple of grams of LSD. And we became friends, and I said, you know, you probably want to be careful with that stuff over here. Um, the laws are different, and the people are different. And sure enough, he got busted, um, like the third night he was there, did a deal with a Honolulu cop. And um, there was his face on the front page of the newspaper the next morning. The next day, he knocked on my door and he said all the charges were dropped. And, I mean, a gr two grams of LSD, that's enough for 10,000 tabs. And um, that's why I was so cautious. I, I, if I didn't know where it came from, I didn't get involved with it because some of it was, was overdosed. I mean, some of it, you know, the quality wasn't there. Um, Osley always kept the quality. I mean, you knew, he knew what he was doing. But like everything else, you know, it, it got in the hands of the wrong people. And um, especially the summer of love, there was a lot of kids that came out that took LSD. They didn't know what they were getting involved with. And um, I think probably that went into people categorically, categorically painting the whole hippie thing as nothing more than bad drugs. Um, and that along with you know the speed, the heroin, all the other things that ultimately came into play, opium. A lot of people don't talk about opium, but opium was there. Smoking opium um, was there early on. Um, I smoked some. I didn't care for it, but it was around. And so, uh, you know, one had to use common sense, I guess is what I would say about, it, about LSD.